Okay, hello and welcome to everybody and another either podcast that you're listening to from themindsolution.com or you might also be listening to this on YouTube. But either way, today I am joined by Louise Kennedy, who is the founder and owner of Oculus HR, which I love the name of. I'd love to find out a little bit more about what Oculus means. It kind of rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? I know. So, well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate uh, that you uh, that I'm on the podcast, and I'm really looking forward to being have our conversation today. So, um, I will explain where Oculus comes from. Actually, so it's um uh, when we were deciding whether to set the business up, uh, kind of where it was going through redundancy point, and making making decisions around it. I was actually in Rome at the time in the Pantheon. I mean, my husband had been walking around, and it was his 40th birthday uh, that we were there for. And as we were in there, there was a there's, there's an Oculus in the ceiling, which is a big circular opening. And um, so it can be like an architectural side of things. It's also a part of an eye. But when we went into the building, there was a light coming through the middle of it. So the sun was shining through the middle of it. And we thought how relevant the fact that actually for what HR is, everything that's in the dark is the, the must do. All the things that we should do, contracts, policies, procedures, everything that we must do, and actually the light coming through is the difference that you can make within a business and help the people that were in there, and um, the employees within the business. So yeah, so that's what it's about. So the darkness is kind of the must do, and the light is what businesses can be able to shine the light to be able to help their employees on. So it's a nice little, nice little story that we have. <laughs> it has, it has, and actually I think it's very fitting for our conversation today about health and well-being in the workplace because as we chatted about before we hit the record button at the Mind Solution we're bringing that light to organizations and to employees to help them to see through the limitations of their thinking which keeps them stuck in the dark keeps them stuck in that prison that is our mindset and how people can break through that and step into the light so yeah we've got we've got a lot of light going on already today Louise definitely I'd love to just have you just share a little bit about your background and why why should people listen to you Louise why should I listen and um, so I, I am we've got a HR company so it's 11 years old now so we're based in the northeast of England but pretty much work throughout the UK kind of as, as we have opened up we were very much around um the day-to-day HR support for businesses which were anybody starting from um taking the first employee on and um, all the way through to businesses that really need some operational support um and then over the last few months really over about the last six seven months we've opened up our services more and um, to be able to provide things like chief people officer roles which are Again, a small business can't always provide to uh to, to people to be able to or, you know to their to their employees that they have someone who's looking at the strategy of a business to being able to take it forward. So and um, we found that to be really successful that we can provide that that senior level to be able to help a small business have strategy without having to pay that big cost of having somebody in house um hundred percent of the time. Mm. So we do that. We, I personally love delivering on the emotional intelligence. So we do kind of assessments and training around emotional intelligence, which is, again, great because that really shapes a, a senior leadership team. So we do that and we do things like mediation and Rising Stars programs. And so there's a huge amount that we actually do. So I think um, from a point of view of us chatting today, I think it'll be great just to be able to understand a little bit more around what we do, how we can help in a business, but also from a from a mindset point of view, how you can shape the way that you're working as a senior leader within a business and um, if you've got the right mindset if you've got that positive um, kind of go-get type attitude um, and with regard to how someone's thinking about it and how they frame the thoughts and the mind of the actions that they're going to actually undertake there as well. So from your experience you've had a number of years running this organization and your background is HR and I think it's probably reasonable to say that in a post-pandemic world that when it comes to health and well-being, I don't think we've ever seen such a focus on health and well-being in the workplace. But I'm curious about what are the most significant trends you're seeing within organisations when it comes to health and well-being in the workplace? Um, I think trend wise, I think I think there's certainly a huge amount more awareness or a freedom of conversation around health and well-being. I think previously, I'm saying previously prior to COVID, I think people would 
would more kind of, you know, deal with their situations or very often someone would be maybe on longer term sick and you'd be trying to encourage them back into work. I think people are, or would certainly feel is that there's more freedom of conversation that's taken place um, within the workplace around kind of ensuring that they're comfortable at work, you know, whether they um, whether they have issues going on outside of work or whether they're in work or whether they're just making their, their workplace aware of any concerns that they have from a from just a health and wellbeing point of view in general. So we've certainly seen um we've certainly seen more of that taking place and and the reach out and the support for companies to be able to provide services such as counseling support. Um, and we work with different different um, council support services that are there, but actually companies are more prepared to pay for that to ensure that actually the, the people that are working for them are well looked after. Um, so we've, that's seen a, a massive increase. And I think what the, the companies have started to see is kind of the payback of loyalty that people have within them if they know that they've paying you know, a couple of thousand pounds being paid out on some type of support service for them, that they're actually the the committed back to the business as well. So we've seen that as being a, a real trend of kind of, com I think it's the shown of commitment from the employer to the employee. And I think that's been really, really beneficial there as well. So I think they're probably the, the main two trends that we've been seeing. Um, but I do certainly believe that more companies are doing more within the workplace and kind of, you know, looking at different strategies of how they, they can help and, and you know, hopefully get to the point that it's not just a tick box exercise, as we were talking about before, it's kind of actually that they can really make a difference to be able to support their employees in, in many different ways there as well. Hmm. Now, playing a bit of devil's advocate with you, picking up on what you said about counselling services. So... As you know, my background is HR and I've been the founder of The Mind Solution for about 12, 13 years. And I still see organizations following what I would suggest is a very traditional approach to helping people in the form of counseling services. And yet we have this world of alternative approaches to health and well-being so you know for me my background as an energy worker an energy healer hypnotherapy you know forms of treating anything that can support people in a far more effective way than traditional talk therapies and I'm wondering if you're seeing any of that from your own experience, where organizations are looking at more what I would call leading ed edge approaches to supporting people and moving away from, you know, old talking therapy support. I don't, I, I genuinely don't, I genuinely think that companies are at a point whereby, or certainly smaller businesses, are struggling with knowing what to do and um, to be able to, pro to provide the support, sorry struggling to know what to do to be able to provide the support to the people. Um, and I think as a, a starting point, there's, there's more of them that are starting to move to be able to offer the support and offer the financial support that comes with that. Um, stepping outside of the normal remit, we don't see a massive amount of companies do that. Um, and I think that's primarily because they're only just starting to think about what it is that they can do um, and to be offer, able to offer some type of support. So if you think kind of a lot of our businesses are smaller businesses or, or growth businesses so maybe he's kind of gone from like 50 to 100 or 150 employees so they're very much in the transactional actions of what it is that they're doing they do want to make sure that the people are engaged and I think that's where we kind of you know we provide support to be able to go in and, and work with the people and to be able to sit down and discuss things with them um, and to be able to and um, to be able to have those conversations with people is great but I also don't think that a lot of people know what it is that they're looking for um, or what type of support that's available. So I think kind of flipping it back around, I think, you know, if, if people were to say kind of, you know, some kind of um, say Reiki or something like that, I think a business would probably struggle with how or some certain some of the business that we deal with would struggle with how that would provide support back to the employee. And I think it's it's really encouraging the employee to come forward to kind of say, well, actually, what is it that you do want um, and what type of you know service and support that, that you need? Because sometimes it is very much about opening up and listening. I've got one which is a, a, a pretty awful situation going on at the moment. And the lady's kind of come forward to say she's, she feels bullied in the workplace. And it's about how to be able to provide that. And, and that was part of our conversation the other day. You know, we can provide some counselling support, but actually, as we just touched on before there, some kind of spiritual support, or we talked about somebody who could do Reiki, you know, so there's other alternative things. 
that particular business probably wouldn't provide the extras, you know, the, the extra type or the different type. They would probably go down the line of providing that day-to-day counselling element of it um, because it's good and it's, it's really strong and it does make a difference. But the other element of it, you know, some businesses, I think, would have to really start looking at how it makes an impact upon the business and the bottom line that it would make to them about the engagement with the employee. So I think it's I think probably there's still quite a pathway to be able to go to be able to make a difference, I think. Yeah, and I think you're right. It's about if people don't, we always do what makes sense to us. And so it would often make sense to offer counselling services. Whereas, for example, on Friday, uh, I'm running, and if you're listening to this, you can sign up on the links below, uh, running a free event, which is all about trauma. And it's how we can heal trauma in the easy way. So, for example, talking therapy is actually the least effective way of dealing with trauma because it actually runs the risk of re-traumatizing people because the unconscious mind, it doesn't know what's real, what's not real. So take somebody, for example, that had been subject to bullying it's likely that they might be suffering from post-traumatic stress or complex PTSD. And being able to process that experience, and I don't mean Reiki, I think Reiki is a very um, specific type of treatment that would probably work more with uh, healing physical conditions than changing our mindset. But in order to process trauma, where we can offer particular healing modalities that can be done in a group environment. Nobody has to have their camera on. Nobody actually needs to talk. And you can heal trauma in a couple of sessions. Okay. Now, for some organizations, thinking particularly about, you know, I know that you work more with smaller organizations, but the NHS, we know that one doctor takes their own life every three weeks in the NHS and one nurse takes their own life every single week. Um, And that's just the NHS, that's not fire brigades, police service, all of that. So where we can look at offering more leading edge ways of treating and healing trauma that supports the individual, but it's actually a more effective way for an organization to support people. So there's a bottom line benefit from that. Does that make sense? So completely. And I think that's I think that's very much where it needs to take the pathway to, you know, for a lot of businesses and that lady that I was just talking about for from bullying point of view, that is very much around, you know, a husband to commit suicide and her mom's just passed away. And so the trauma of what she's had has probably ignited into where she is now. So and it's and the the conversation we were having was the counselling support that she was receiving wasn't quite doing enough for her. She was still having kind of a a blockage about a certain part of it. So it's so interestingly, yeah, exactly what it would be, you know, understanding that there's different areas, and and I think it's it is about educating people that there are different things that are out there and available for people to be able to use, and um, and I think that comes down to kind of what's what's promoted as being the services available within the within the localities of where people and the businesses actually are as well so i think it's it's that promotion element of an understanding you know businesses understanding more of what's available and the and the impact that it can make on people um and i think unless potentially people have got that idea themselves that that's what they want you know that's the difficulty isn't it because then you not only have to educate the business but you're also educating the the employee to to ask for those things unless they kind of have that awareness and understanding from their own point of view yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Well, share the link with her. Yes, yes. Um, the, the session that I'm going to be doing <laughs> is incredible. Absolutely incredible um, at treating and healing trauma. So do feel free to share that with her and anybody else. Yeah. Now, another area that I see a lot of organisations paying more heed to is mental health training for managers and I'm again curious what are you seeing around that particular area in organizations yeah I think that no I think there definitely has been a rise around this um I think there obviously the, there's the mental health first aid training side of things from my experience of it it's only just from a personal opinion point of view I don't think it's been particularly I think people who have been trained in that type of way still don't really know what to do if somebody approaches them. I think they've they've got an, an overriding awareness of, 
you know, conditions. But I think if somebody actually approached them, I think then there's a, a real difficulty about what the next steps would be. So I think if a business has that, then, then um, they also need to be able to signpost the people who have that training of what services are going to be available and what support is going to be available within the business. Because I think sometimes the people use, you know, the, the mental health first data, then they'll go and speak to them, but they then don't know what to do with it. So they they then end up carrying that that burden with them, kind of knowing that they need to help provide the help and support. So so I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of that unless the business really provides that um, surrounding culture to be able to enable that to happen. Um, I think uh, if some of our businesses um, do or a couple of businesses that we work with as being providers of mental health training, I think that, that again, I think that's probably got a better place um, because that's being tailored towards the actual business. It's enabled them to open up more around actually what what impact is it and um, one of the one of the businesses that work like that they they kind of have the the stats around actually maybe it might be about drug use in the area or it might be about alcoholism and you know so actually when that can be brought in <clears throat> when that can be brought into it then I think that makes a significant difference because actually you can tailor that very much around you know what 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 are the trends within that local area and, and what can you do to help but again it's about not just providing the managers the information it's about them what, what have they got the ability to be able to do what will the business be able to provide to help and support from that point of view so I think it's it's a step but I don't think it's kind of the the full step um some of our clients will kind of do um like educational programs or so just working with a company at the minute who are doing that you know they're going to kind of do a series of six or seven programs across a couple of different sites that they've got in and around all these different areas but they'll be run by psychologists so again that means that it can really dig di deep dive into particular areas and we can develop the programs that they want so i think that type of thing i think probably probably hooks people in a little bit more because then they'll understand a little bit more and learn some more from there as well. So so I think the mental health training for managers has got a place, but I think it's it's about how it sends support within the business as well, taking it forward. Yeah, no, and I totally agree with you. And I'm very much in agreement with your comments about mental health first aiders because mental health first aiders, the reason that they actually were introduced in the first place was nothing actually to do with mental health. It, um, it was because there was so much bullying in the workplace going on that they wanted almost sort of internal mediators to be able to support it. Um, and it developed into mental health first aid. But I know from my experience, I mean, I'm a psychotherapist. I've held about 10,000 one-to-one sessions with people. And, you know, I'll be really honest, I was quite horrified that people were going through potentially one, two days training and then being let loose. Everything being and let I was like, oh, my God. Well, um, the, the individual, isn't it? You know, the person who comes through the training. That could it be your really is. Because as you say, I mean, the, the topic of mental health is huge, absolutely huge. And people were walking away from this training with almost like a tomb of conditions and from my point of view, it's not about, under, for a mental health first aider, it's actually not about understanding the condition or even necessarily being able to spot signs. That's not their role, but it is about the core skills of really being able to hold a space for somebody, to really be able to listen, to connect, to ask the right questions, and I think what I've seen working with organizations is some of them have got it really, have got it right um, in that they've continued to give training to mental health first aiders. Because if, if the mental health first aider as well is also struggling with mental health, then they've got a vested interest in wanting to support people. But they're a little bit at risk of trying to jump in and fix things and that's not their role. So I think the mental health first aiders program, it probably had the right intention, but it really needed a lot of the core skills training. It needed a lot of interactive training about, you know, for example, on our mental health for managers training, we do loads around solution focused coaching, around listening skills, boundaries, psychological safety, so that managers can hold that space without feeling like they have to jump in and fix the problem, solve the problem. So I totally agree with you. 
And I think that's explaining about the difference between like sympathy and empathy as well, isn't it? You know, when you when people are in that type of situation, kind of the the listening skills are so important within there, as you say, they kind of save the space, but for them not to take that burden themselves, but need to kind of, you know, be able to do the right things and to be able to take the relevant actions. But I think empathy is definitely the the part that needs to play within making a decision to be a mental health first aid or, or, or participate in some type of training of that way as well. And one of the things that comes through so much from our mental health training for managers, well, a big, big part of it is awareness. Mm -hmm. So many managers have kind of almost jo joked. They're like, God, I'm stressed. And I didn't even realize I was stressed. Um, so uh, I think some of it is also how they support themselves, how they fit their own air mask first before helping other people, like they teach you on an airplane. Mm -hmm. But one of the really big things that we see, because we work a lot in the US, is a culture of when managers are, are chatting to their teams, they kind of almost sort of go automatically, if you like, straight into work mode. And there isn't just that normal kind of human interaction, the, what we might refer to as the water cooler moments, yeah. where it's like, Louise, how, how are you today? How are you really doing today? It's, you know, it's that focus that's always on work and objectives and this, that and the other. And what's your views or thoughts or observations around that, Louise? I, th I think that it's been significantly different, you know, when we're doing the likes of Zooms and Teams and things like that. So that 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 chit chat side of things probably gets a little bit more pushed to one side. So I don't think you do. I'm just thinking that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Deborah, was away in London at the weekend. We went to problem this morning, went straight into work mode with text and said, hope we've had a nice weekend. But then the conversation started straight away of what we're going to do with this, how we're going to do it. And I'm just thinking I never went back to it and said, did you actually enjoy taking the kids away? You know, um, because because sometimes I think you you do just naturally go into work mode. And I think that's because when you spend time on the phone and on the kind of the, the teams calls and things, I think it's it, you feel very or much more limited on time, I think, because you're trying to speed things through, not to hold everything up. So I think there's. The, there's a significant difference and I think you notice that by doing all of the the teams and the, the video conference inside of things the, there's there's not as much of the chit chat to be able to do that and I think it's sometimes about how you can so a couple of weeks ago um, we kind of went out as a team just to be able to sit and just have a you know kind of bit of a ban of talking around work side of things but to be able to sit and just have a proper conversation a proper catch up and I think those type of certainly for us as a small business that like they're really needed and um, catch up moments and we did that between holidays so we knew that we, some had been away some were going away but it was important to kind of have a bit of a stop moment to be able to just to be able to chat you know just to be able to kind of reach out um and I think it's also about how you how you position yourself so for all I've said that a couple of weeks ago one of the team members had, had messaged and said I really need to have a conversation with you today and you go into that are you all right you know is that and then it, it's about what you do then as a business owner to ensure that actually that conversation takes place during the day because you know if they've reached out for that conversation and they obviously was a serious conversation they want to have I therefore make time during that day to be able to enable that conversation to happen and that becomes the priority of the day you know to ensure that from my point of view my staff well-being at that moment in time was the, was the priority that it take place so I think you kind of can view it from different areas can't you, you can view it from a colleague relationship side of things that you know you maybe do a little bit more chit chat but then sometimes from a business owner point of view and, and the people that you've got working with it to be able to give them the space and time to have a, an open conversation I think it is really important and I think if they if they know you well enough that actually if there's a problem they're going to reach out and they're going to get the response back that they need I think that's also a really important part of being a business owner I think because you want you know, from a personal point of view I want to be at my best to be able to do it, but actually I want to make sure that any any concerns that the team's got that that I can try to help them resolve sooner rather than later so they're not carrying any type of you know underlying burden that's there as well so I think there's kind of there's different elements went off on tangent there really a little bit but kind of there's a there's different elements of it there I think which is really important and I think coming back to what you said the listening part of it and I think empathy is, is a two core points of being able to just be open with people yeah and what's your advice or input for managers in a world where people are working so much more from home, they're doing so much more remote working that 
in terms of now I'm going to sound really ancient when I say back in my day, back in my day when we didn't have, yeah, you know, I mean, you had to fight to get flexible working in my day, but you did have those, you know, you would walk from meeting to meeting or building to building. There was so much more physical interaction that took place or even just being in the kitchen, making a cup of tea and somebody had come in and you'd, you'd have that interaction. But where managers now, as you say, are so much more connected through Teams or Zoom. I mean, I remember talking to one individual who worked for um, a bank and she only met her manager online. They were both in separate offices and her manager had never even turned his camera on. She said, I have no idea what this man looks like. And I thought, oh my goodness, surely this is basic common sense that, yeah. that we create that, but common sense isn't necessarily common practice as we know. So for, for managers that are managing teams on that more remote platform, what do you think they need to be doing more of to connect with their people on that human level? Um, I think it's very much about it's about keeping the connection, you know, or starting a good connection, you know, from a starting point. If somebody's new into a business, I think it's it's very much about establishing those um the, the boundaries that go with it, actually, you know, about working from home. And I think being able to ask them about what they would want and then being able to say, well, from a business point of view, we we do this and whether that's a touch base point, you know, every week or kind of, you know, but certainly things as you've just said there, you know, camera needs to be on so you can so you can get eye contact, so you can you can look at people, so you can have a conversation, so you can engage with them properly, I think are, are all really important points of it. Um I know certain ones about business will then who all work remotely will organize to do maybe it's once a quarter they'll get together and do kind of the you know a work day together or kind of a structured meeting so there's a little bit more well also there's more interaction I think inevitably and my preference still is that you do things face to face as opposed to necessarily kind of over a video conference but the video conference has got its real good place for it and actually you know we're, we're now at the point where we can recruit anybody in the world to work for you because uh, you know because you have these facilities there but I think it's still really important that that human interaction element of it so you know being able to open up and to be able to have conversations with people I think the managers really need to take responsibility for that in in some way um, and I think sometimes you don't always recognize you know you assume everybody likes remote working or hybrid working but actually I think it's it's having those individual conversations with people to be able to say actually what works for you you know is it is it being in an office environment is it being sometimes people just don't want to be in the home environment either so it could be a case that actually some companies rent office space for people or kind of you know share desk space with other companies to be able to get them out of the home because they don't want to be at home all the time so I think it's very much about the manager opening up the conversation and and to be able to kind of you know ask the different questions and to kind of push the the employees to ask them what they want and you know kind of keep that as a continuous flow of conversation that takes place not just uh, well I asked you two years ago and this is what you said you wanted because I think everybody's lives change that much and I think people's mental capacity changes that much of you know kind of what they're dealing with at home or external at home you know I think we need to keep a free flow of conversation that happens I think that only happens through conversation doesn't it you know so the, the regularity of putting time to one side to be able to um you know speak to people on a one-to-one -one basis I think really makes a difference yeah I know um, there's several organisations that have invested in our employee wellbeing platform. So we have a platform that's got um, EFT tapping. Have you ever heard of EFT tapping, Louise? I certainly have, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, you are my kind of woman from the North <laughs> and you've heard of EFT tapping. I've heard of the tapping. <laughs> it's so, so, so leading edge. Um, so it gives people access to that, to... Um, videos about mental health, loads of amazing techniques, tools, resources. And one of the things that I loved, um, Media Cause, an organization in the US were doing, and gosh, I can't remember the name, ISN Software. They would often, with teams that were quite remote and spread um, across the world, they would use the platform and they'd pick a video and they might do it once a month and it might just be a sort of a five minute video about a particular aspect of the mind or mental health and everybody would watch it and then people would just have a conversation 
as part of their team monthly meeting. And what was really fascinating is one particular manager that comes to my mind that had gone through our mental health training, he managed huge remote teams. And he said, we've never really talked about stress or burnout or anything as a team. And I said, well, what, what about, you know, if you were to get the team to watch this particular video and everyone just talk about their, their thoughts, what they got from it, the golden nuggets. And he got more from his team by doing that activity than he'd ever had. And there was a number of people that came forward and said, actually, I really struggle with this. I really struggle with that. So it was a beautiful way of starting the conversation. But I think it was a real eye opener for him because he just assumed because he didn't hear from people that everybody in his team was OK. And it's mm -hmm. like never make assumptions. We never know what's going on behind closed doors. And actually what they did is they committed to doing that. So it kept not just mental health and well-being, but understanding, as we said, understanding the mind, understanding what actually is stress. How do we how do we respond to situations? How do we navigate the inner reality that is our mindset? And just saw such a difference in the team dynamics, a lot more psychological safety. I'm not going to say productivity because it wasn't something that they necessarily measured to be able to say that that increased productivity, but it was it was something that he really saw the value of doing on that monthly basis that, you know, the organization had paid for, paid for the platform. And it was like, let's look at more creative ways that we can utilize it. Does that make sense? Completely. And I think the, from a mindset point of view, I think it, it very much, if you can open conversations up with the right people, and I think you can frame your mindset of what it is that you you want to do and what it is that you want to achieve. So I think being able to open it up in those conversations that enables others to then come and say, well, actually, well, I've got some concerns of this or this happens in a personal life. I think it's just opening conversations up, which I think helps to frame the mindset around, you know, how it is that you behave and the thoughts. Of, uh, one of the books that I'd read recently was around um people having like faulty thinking and fruity thinking which is kind of a nice way to be able to thinking. <laughs> but I quite like the way uh, you wrote the book um, uh, shut up and move on and it's quite a it's quite a nice way of kind of you know your faulty thinking is kind of well I've always done it that way I'm always going to continue to do it that way you know well you know it's that worthless worry element of it you know it's always negative thinking so it's all very much the, the faulty thinking and then changing that up to being like the fruity thinking to think well actually if we if I think different I can reframe things differently in the more you think differently the more you act differently and the more the, the outcomes are going to be different and it's all based around kind of actually yes you can worry about something but actually put a plan in place that if a happens b happens c happens then you know you've got a plan to be able to do it as opposed to just kind of worthlessly thinking about what could be so i, I quite like the the terminology of that because that does kind of give to me is like the the fault you think there's very much the negative and the fruit you think there's very much the positive and about how you can get to a point to, and certainly i've been able to learn how to do this over the last couple of years get to the point of actually knowing that you're going down a negative pathway of how you think in a mindset and actually how you can then turn that back around to become fruitly thinking you know that you that you are thinking differently because actually they're thinking different gives you different results at the end of the day so I think there's kind of a huge element around that and I think opening as you've just said opening conversations up in the workplace where people can think a little bit different and and the given permission that it's okay to have those conversations because I think that's the other part that people don't know whether they can or can't have conversations like that so I think being able to open it up and then people feel comfortable with it I think is the it's probably the key part of it as a starting point for the discussions in, in the workplace. Yeah. And following on from that, what is it that you think that leaders of organisations, whether that's an organisation of 50 people or 5,000 people, what do the leadership teams need to be doing more of when it comes to employee wellbeing in the workplace? Because you know, yes, there's more of a focus on employee well-being, but I still hear the term, um, you know, we're a fast-paced organisation and still hear a lot around burnout, um, continuing rises in suicide, mental health, things like that. So from a cultural aspect or a strategic aspect, what do you think that leaders do need to be still doing more of? 
I think I think it comes back to what we've been talking about throughout. Really, I think it is that very much that listening element of kind of of who who needs what and when and how. And I think it's the um, trying to develop the the culture within the business that they that they can understand what their ability is to be able to move things forward with it as well. You know, kind of how they can they've got the opportunity of being able to shape the business, haven't they? And they've been able to to really drive the business forward for it. And I think it's the the opportunity to to listen to what it is that people actually want within within the business, you know, the employees that are in there that, that can start um, shaping and changing because actually it's the employees that ultimately end up, you know, kind of delivering the services that that need to be provided within there. So so I think, yeah, I think that's probably where it would come come down to, I think, listening to your employees, but also kind of coming up with the the ideas and and doing the research around actually what 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 does make an uh, an organisation successful around you know what would work and I think there's so many different industries and sectors I mean we work with any, anyone from kind of GP surgeries to kind of um, you know manufacturing or people who repair boats in the in the Indian Ocean you know so yeah so I think there's so many different types of mindset that's kind of taking place there and I think all the all the leaders really need to listen to their employees about what's important to them and. And, and making them aware that it's okay to have those conversations and to be able to open them real, really up, I think. And what about HR leaders? So we know, you know, we work with a lot of um, organisations where HR, unless they've maybe got a wellbeing lead in place, a wellbeing manager that's got that training, has got that background, um, you know, we recently developed a health and well-being strategy for an organization and the HR director, which was lovely, she said, you know, we're not experts in this field. You know, she's a she's an HR expert. She knows what's needed for an HR strategy. But health and well-being, it's sort of like a bit like we talked about earlier, that kind of like, well, I, th I think this might work, uh, but it can end up being a lot of throwing jelly against the wall and hoping that it sticks rather than it being a really strategic way forward to develop um, health and well-being strategies. So what is it that you think that HR leaders would need that can help them to deliver a more strategic approach to health and well-being? I think I think it genuinely is about reaching out and knowing when to ask for the support for it. Because I think as you've just said there, you know the the people that are in you know a HR role, you know, whether it's a, a business partner role or kind of as a director position. I think they're very much kind of they've been in those positions and they may well have been in the same company for 10, 15 years. And actually, if you don't if you don't step out to go and learn more, um, kind of you know doing sort of your, your different conferences. Obviously, there's so many different conferences that take place. But I think unless you kind of step out to be able to learn more about it. And I think you kind of you're always just in that same mindset of it. And I think that's where actually reaching out for support to people like yourselves to be able to bring in to be able to actually wake and their make their own awareness waken up to it. I think it's like kind of a crucial part of it because I don't I don't think people know enough when they're just in one business from that point of view. I think they need, they need to be exposed further to what it is. And I, I'm a big believer is kind of, you know, it's absolutely fine to ask for the help and support. And, and we certainly say that, you know, obviously when we're talking to other HR people, I think I think they think, oh, well, we need to kind of keep these people like the likes of us at arm's length because they're just going to kind of come in. But actually when you can add the best practice into it and, and what we see within other businesses and being able to bring that to it, I think is a, is a massive help to businesses. But I think when you've got... And, you know kind of using companies that are specialist in you know in many different areas you know kind of you know whether it's health and well-being whether it's in um whether it's in some like uh, recruitment strategies or you know like actually you can reach out and you can ask for the help to make sure that the work that you're doing is really kind of lead an edge um within your business and i think you know these things don't always have to cost a fortune but the, the level of expertise that you can buy in a kind of invaluable within a business so i think it's the it's the reaching out it's the reaching out or certainly going out and exploring more themselves to be able to understand what actually is out there and attending conferences, making sure that they're up to date and joining kind of the community groups around kind of, you know, different things that are online or wherever it may be. But I think, I think kind of, I suppose, in essence, surrounding yourself with the right people to enable you to be able to develop the best, the best for the business, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, when it comes to organisations measuring the effectiveness of these initiatives again maybe if they're not linked to an overall health and well-being strategy or an overall hr strategy 
what advice would you give to the people function about how to measure the effectiveness where they are investing? Because as we know, there's always going to be a bottom line. There's so much money to go around. And often when we have conversations with organizations and I might say, you know, what's your budget for this? And they say, well, we actually haven't really got a budget. It's yeah. like, okay, how are you going to measure the effectiveness so that you can go back to the exec team or you can go back to the board and say, this is specifically what it's delivered. Where do you think, or what advice would you give to HR or learning and development or any of those those kind of functions about how it, how to measure in real time the effectiveness of some of these initiatives? I think it's understanding your starting point. I think it's kind of getting to the point of actually you this is where you are here and now, and actually how can you how can you take that gauge because you need to you need to have some type of record of starting point to ensure that kind of an assessment you know two three four five six seven months down the line you've actually got something to be able to gauge your back against us so i think i think having some type of starting point there i think is really important and whether that's kind of um and we do it with some of our kind of clients with different programs that we do kind of we do, we do a, a hr mentoring program and we kind of do a bit of a kind of questions and survey around kind of where they are at the very beginning of it um, and then kind of a touch base point in the middle of it and then at the end of it so we can actually so that the impact can be measured over that period of time so so we kind of you know put things in place where actually you've got your data to be able to make the measurements if you I think if you're just trying to measure at the end and you didn't know where your starting point was I think that becomes really difficult and I think some people do try and do that you know kind of the, the try and look at the effectiveness but what did it compare against I think so that's really important to understand and I think I think also being able to look at things such as really your, your employee retention and your engagement that you've got I think those couple of areas really can play a key role in there and again you need something to kind of measure it against but um you know we, we've helped certain people in businesses uh, from one business of support to kind of three or four different people who were um, uh, one particular guy was, you know, going to commit suicide, and the the support service that we were able to provide for a business. Can I you on that, Louise? Can yeah. I just put just on a um, raising awareness of how we now refer to it? We don't refer to it anymore as commit suicide. Like there's, there was a huge shift. It's okay. take your own life. Take your own life. Okay. Okay, start that bit again. Um, so uh, within one of the businesses, uh, we had four different people, and one of the individuals um was gonna was trying to take his own life at the time, um, and the the support service that had been provided by the business kind of enabled that to to not happen, you know, because he would reach out, he would do the relevant things. Other people who were kind of um doing uh, kind of you know harming themselves, uh, being again really difficult situation. And the impact that we kind of saw over those four individuals, another couple of people were, were drug addicts, and um, one of them had had a crash in the workplace. So we kind of we were able to facilitate and to be able to support them through that. Um, but actually the, the payback of that is that these people are very, very engaged. They're still in the business three, four years down the line. You know, they reach out and ask for support because they've been given the safe space to be able to do that. So sometimes it's not always just kind of in the numbers and um, it's just it's been a case that actually we've got the loyalty back from it which actually you then buy into that you you keep your talent you keep the people that are within your business there because they, they've got the knowledge within the business there so so even just on on that example there you know we can we can tell that there's a difference being made but I think it's it, you, you do need to have some form of kind of where's your starting point where's where's your, your point of review as you work through yeah absolutely and I guess one of my final questions, which has now just completely gone out of my head. Oh gosh, it really has. You keep talking and it'll come back to me. <laughs> All right, I've had to write a couple of things down here because I said things I was thinking I forgot what was said. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's gone sailing through my mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, the reason I, I asked that question as well is I was really surprised. Oh, it's come back to me now. I know what it is. Um, but I was really surprised that some there are some organisations that don't even measure absence, which I guess maybe that's my own experience of working in HR that we absolutely measured absence we reported on absence you know we sat in front of a, a strategy board and exec board every month which often to me felt like the x factor <laughs> and 
we'd have to report on what we'll be actively doing mm -hmm. to reduce absence and you know reduce uh, employee relations issues all of that kind of thing which is why you know when I had my huge light bulb moment that this was a a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that was missing that giving people the knowledge and insight about the mind and mindset and physical health and well-being if people had access to that we could take a very different approach to absence so it still surprises me that there are organizations that don't measure absence so when I talk to them about mental health training for managers and say you know what are the kind of themes that you've got they're actually not really in a position to know that because some of them have got cultures where they can just take time and they don't need to give a reason for that time which I do support that but it's unless you've got very good HR business partners that are on the ground it's almost like well where do we start if we don't know what the problem is that we're trying to resolve does that make sense it absolutely does so there's um there's quite a lot of small businesses don't necessarily call their absence um from a, a longer term absence point of view and a shorter term absence and one ongoing one that I've got at the moment is, you know, someone who's been off for, you know, they got in touch with, the, the business got in touch with me, individual had been off for seven months, decided they want to come back to work, they weren't really fit enough to be able to come back to work, and um, so kind of working with them to be able to kind of work through the process and kind of here we are six months later and they're, they're still not well enough to be able to come back to work, but actually that business would have got themselves into a bit of a pickle by not really knowing how to do that, so there's there's a lot of um, work around kind of the the longer term absences and again the help and support that can give to people and and those open conversations there's, start, there's lots of statistics around people who've been off for over 12 months the likelihood of being able to get them back into work after that 12 month period if there's been very limited contact from the workplace is is very very low and um, but actually to be able to reach out and we always say kind of every four or five weeks meeting with people and um, you know from when their absence starts to be able to have open conversations and actually then the business can decide what help and support that they can have and give them and kind of help facilitate a, a successful return back to work when the employee is ready to be able to do that. Um, or if, it, if it's a point where they need to exit them out of the business, but at least the, the track's been there to be able to follow through. So I think definitely from the longer term absence and I think short term absence again is so important to be able to kind of have in place so that again you're opening the conversations you're talking about underlying health conditions and yes you have to give some type of warnings out sometimes if people kind of over abuse that and there's no kind of underlying conditions there but but you're right there's so many people that don't or so many businesses still don't really record their absences and you you need or or allow people to put holidays in to cover absence as well you kind of sometimes hide in the the concerns there that actually if there are people who've got genuine you know well-being issues or kind of longer term health conditions Conditions that actually the business doesn't always get to see what they are because they're not asking the right questions around it so so for me it's one of the things that we are quite passionate around because I think that can and businesses have seen an impact upon that once you do put some structure in place and to be able to help that I think there's a there was a relief once they see that actually if you did a b and c in the right order that it helps the employees facilitate them returning to work or being in work as well so I think there's there's some real benefits out of it. And it's one of the reasons that we're so passionate about mental health training for managers, because it's part of that um, supporting people to get back to work. Um, I mean, I still work as a, as a private coach and therapist. And I remember one lady that I worked with, she was a director, actually, in one of the banks. And she'd been out of the business for about four months, which in her position had a tremendous impact um, within the organization. And she'd come to a session and she'd had a conversation with her direct manager who said, are you feeling as a sort of, you know, well-being chat, let's check in and see how you're doing. Um, he'd asked her, are you feeling worse, better or about the same? <laughs> I just thought, please give me the telephone number for your uh, for your HR director so that we can get mental health training and how to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. she said, I just cringed. I just cringed. And so it 
Thanks and it's difficult for them being in that situation, sorry to interrupt there, but it's difficult for them being in it because actually they then don't know, you know, it's difficult to then respond when someone's asked you in that type of way. So it, it, it helps facilitate the conversation if they know how to do it right and put just the right terminology around certain aspects and being able to be supportive towards people who are off. I mean, as that lady four months at that higher level within a business, it's not, it'd be difficult for her and for the business, wouldn't it? Well, thankfully, she came to me and we got back into work. But, <laughs> but um, so there was the circumstances where people actually may well have reached out to you and they pay for it themselves, you know, rather than through a business to be able to facilitate it because they know that they need it. And if back to what we talked about earlier, you know, sometimes people need to know what they need prior to, to being able to ask for it. I think that is, is one of the biggest points. I think when people aren't exposed to the different services that are available, I think it, you know, once yeah. they're exposed, it makes an impact. No, absolutely. And I remember um, delivering training for one organization, again, mental health training for managers, and I mentioned hypnotherapy and the marketing director actually got in touch with me and she said, um, I really, really struggle with a fear of public speaking. And she said, I can't avoid it anymore. I've spent most of my career really passionate about what she does, but she'd been promoted. She now uh, reported into the CEO. And yet, I mean, the fear of public speaking is rife, absolutely rife. And it's, it's one of the areas I've always specialized in. And it wasn't until she was made aware that there's a different approach because she tried CBT, she tried counselling, got nowhere with it. Um, and then within literally a handful of sessions, she just transformed. Her confidence was through the roof. She was pitching, she was presenting all the things that were required yeah. at her level. So I, I absolutely agree with you. And mindset side of things as well isn't it you know so I know my son's had hypnotherapy for flying so we've flown all over the world and all of a sudden he's became scared of flying so so he's had hypnosis to be able to to enable him to get back on a plane to be able to, to be able to do it so I think once you realize that's available and, and you find someone that you can trust to do that then it, it opens opportunities back up there as well Absolutely. It's one of the reasons that we love doing um, and we get such good feedback with our employee wellbeing webinars because um, we bring things that people would never have necessarily heard of like EFT and we'll no. run laser sessions where we'll actually do a live demo, which people absolutely love because within 10 minutes, if you've experienced EFT, you know this, it's like, mm. oh, I feel completely different. It's like this this almost seems too good to be true. And it's like, no, it's very rooted in science. Yeah. So when we can do things like that, and it just opens a whole gateway up to people, a whole doorway of possibility of things that they can do to support themselves, which actually leads into my, my next question. Um, if you have got somebody, and this is maybe more of a UK-based question, but if you have got somebody who is on long-term sick, that's struggling with their mental health, but they're not really taking the kind of accountability. They're maybe not doing everything that they can to support themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have engaged in the EAP services. Maybe they have had some of the, say, counseling that was available, but that they're still not back at work. What's the current stance in terms of what organisations can do? Because as we know, we've got the Equality Act in the UK, we can't discriminate, but where you have got somebody that isn't taking accountability for their health and wellbeing, where does the land lie with organisations? Um, I think you, you obviously every company needs to be very careful about the, the steps that they take and make sure that they, they get some advice around the rights and wrongs of, of how to do it. Um, but I think, as I mentioned there before, you know, when somebody goes onto onto longer term sick, and that for me is anything kind of four to five weeks is when kind of the, is the is the the flag for for us to start kind of managing situations. And I think when you've got the regularity of conversations taking place again every four, five, six weeks with somebody, it's that provides a structure of what it is that you you know about somebody, so you know whether they're accountable, whether they are reaching out, whether they've done 
some of the things um, that we we'll talk about talk and therapies, obviously through the, the, the NHS services or whether they're reaching out to do something kind of privately or whether they're doing something through the workplace and keep providing those opportunities to them. And I think making them accountable during the course of those meetings of kind of, have you followed this up? Have you done this? Is there a reason that you haven't been in touch with I don't know, Booper or have you, you know, you haven't reached out to them, you know, that this is available to them. And I think you, as a business, you can only do so much, you know, you can only offer so much, you can only make available as much as what it is. And it, it's got to be down to the individual to, to want to make a difference and coming back to when we've touched on mindset, it's got to be their mindset that encourages them to be able to want to do that. And I think always making sure that they've got the right people around them kind of at home if, if they can, you know, that they're, that they're, they're supported in any which way they can. So I think but there is a point where you exhaust all those opportunities from a business point of view. And I think you can provide um, occupational health um, assessments to be done and that can be done, you know, quite early doors of when someone's gone off and then kind of, you know, later down the track where if you're actually at a point of thinking, the individual's unlikely to come back to work. We've done as much as what we can. We've offered as much as what we can to be able to do it. Um, and then it may be a case that there's another occupational health assessment that takes place or a GP report maybe. Um, and then sometimes it's about making a decision that actually you may well need to exit them out of the business um, because you've actually done as much as what you can and you've followed all the steps through and you've offered all the support that can be done. But ultimately, from a business point of view, there is somebody needed to be able to do that role. And that's why they're employed to do it in the first place. So, so I think, yes, you're absolutely right around the Equality Act. You know, you have to be you have to be very careful about it. And I think that's where making sure that you've done all the right things at the right time is really, really important. But I think, you know, a business can only wait so long to enable that person to be able to come back. And that that can vary, you know, smaller businesses, might, some businesses might be six seven months and you know they're desperate by which point you be able to get someone to return to work some bigger businesses might be kind of 12 18 months before they before they do that but but it's all very relevant based upon the individual circumstances and the situations that's there but the the main point of that is kind of offering the support you know and being able to exhaust all of your options and seeing where the individual takes their makes their own decisions from there really yeah it kind of uh highlights the need for prevention over cure as well doesn't it it does it is and i think that's whereby i think where we kind of started with you know and sometimes when you see people in the workplace that are starting to you know have some problems are you aware that there's something external that's going on and we've had situations before where um i was called into a business where uh, this this guy had kind of obviously kind of lost his temper with one of the other employees no i was called down to speak to both of the individuals and nobody knew what was going on with the guy. And actually his wife had had a mental breakdown when his children being diagnosed with autism. The other one was getting diagnosed with ADHD. So the, the, the gentleman just had so much turmoil that was going on and actually didn't know how to vent vent what was taking place. And he, and he did it completely incorrectly and he knew that he had. However, that's difficult in a workplace, isn't it? Because actually there needs to be seen to be, it needs to be managed from a workplace point of view. And people that's where people need to be open and honest to be able to speak to their, their linemen, just to be able to, you know, make people aware of what people their own personal circumstances are sometimes, just to give them the the understanding more than anything else. So I think there's a there's a big part to play around the talking and the listen um, in all of this. That also reminds me of what we said earlier: is where managers can have those more chit chat conversations, those water cooler like. You know, how how are you doing how are you really doing you don't have to ask it every day but mm. I'm really curious that if that manager of the individual had had more awareness of what was going on in that personal that person's life and actually that individual felt psychologically safe to share some of that how that incident could have been prevented mm. um, and how the manager could have dealt with it in more compassionate terms yeah. And I was doing some uh, emotional intelligence assessment training the other day. So they'd done the assessments and I was doing the, the coaching part afterwards. And one individual had said, um, it said, oh, I got an email from two of the senior leaders who both said, is everything all right? You, you're not your normal self, you know, is everything OK? And, I, and, and he was absolutely honoured that they'd taken the time to be able to do that. And I said, do you not have that conversation when you're in the kitchen? You know, is that and he went oh yeah, I have it all the time. I just didn't realise I was having it until you've just mentioned it. You know, so he hadn't realised that people were asking about his well-being. They knew that, you know, they, they'd picked up uh, the same as when you're working with people day in, day out, you know, when there's, you know, when there's something not quite right with somebody and they'd been picking that up softly and gently with him. And um, he hadn't really kind of put it, but then once it was actually in writing and he just, and his comment was, nobody had ever asked me that before. 
And, you know, I thought, how special is that? And it's literally just being a, just want to make sure everything's all right with you. You know, like, you just, you don't seem to be quite yourself at the minute. Please do let us know. And he was so pleased and honoured and opened up quite easily to his manager then, um, to his two managers about what the circumstances were. But what interesting is that the, the questions over the water cooler in the kitchen had been had, but actually it was only it was physically in writing that it made him realise that actually he's obviously behaving in a slightly different way, that, that people around him have been close enough to understand when there wasn't some when there was something a little bit out of the norm for him so it's um to put the, the questions are important to have i think or ask absolutely so my final question because we could be here for two hours two northern <laughs> masses chatting away <laughs> um, and this might there, there probably isn't a sort of one size fits all answer to this but i'm curious about your thoughts about where well-being actually should sit in an organization and the reason that I ask this is I find with some organizations that you have some individuals that are taking responsibility for well-being initiatives that actually don't sit in the people function so for example we were approached by a huge pharmaceutical company um, who undoubtedly would have had a massive people function. And it was the um, corporate sustainability manager that was organizing mental health training for managers. And I said to her, I said, why, what, you know, why, 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 <laughs> why are you arranging this and not either, you know, your, your HR manager or learning and development manager. And she said, oh, I've just kind of been given responsibility for, for well-being. And, and I was really, really surprised about that. But I'm finding that from my obs observations that it's almost like um, well-being hasn't really been given a home. It kind of gets a bit sort of passed around a little bit. So obviously within certain organizations depending on size that might be a factor but yeah where, where do you think that well-being should belong and live well I think it's a I think it could well to me it's across the whole of the leadership really isn't it it's it's a it's the overarching of the leadership but I think the actual a couple of different uh, thoughts I just had there while you were talking I think it's so it's, I think it's firmly set to the leadership and I think the accountability and conversations need to be happening from the boardroom all the way down you know that actually that should be part of the um the conversations that they're having when they're opening things up or when they're opening conversations up around kind of the well-being and looking after their people um I think it for me it does sit within the people side of things because actually and um, the people have all the other strategies or should be having all the other people's strategies that are focused on. So I think they all fit together like a jigsaw. So I think there's there's certain parts of it, but I don't think they need to kind of take full responsibility for all the actions. I think, you know, within within the business, I think if you do kind of committees, whether it's like a culture committee or whether it's a well-being committee or something, where you've got different people from different parts of the business that are coming together. And I suppose in essence, maybe he's doing kind of like an action group, you know, to be able to um to be able to make a change or to be able to kind of come forward with suggestions or whether they're allocated a certain amount of money but you know having someone from people within there who kind of is the I suppose in essence the overall you know CSO type person or they're the ones that can feed back into the leadership around it but I think having people from different areas in the business which they'll all have completely different experiences depending upon the size of the business I think it's really good to open conversations and I think as long as you haven't got people I think as long as it's proactive I think there's some as long as there's some kind of reference about what what is trying to be achieved like what's your terms of reference what what are you trying to achieve within the group and actually what's the scope what what decision making can you actually have and people that want to be on there that actually want to make a difference you know to be able to to be able to look after the business so I think there's there's a few different threads of that that fall into it but I think for me the overall is the leaders then the people need to take the responsibility for it but I think then there's it can be kind of put out to different committees across businesses to be able to make it fit together and you know, you see them being able to organise, you know, different days and activities and, you know, wellbeing sessions or, you know, there's so many different things that can open up for a business. And I think if you've got a wider scope of people that have all got responsibility for it, then you're taking in so many different ideas, as as we've said throughout this. Sometimes people don't know what's available and actually by having a wider group of people and that conversation can be a lot more open and honest and, you know, can make other people think about situations. So, yeah, I think there's, there's to me, it fits under other strands. It's It's not just kind of, one person does everything, isn't it? And as you say, that 
the place that you were talking about is a bit of a different place. I wouldn't have probably put it under the kind of the corporate structure element of it there. No, that was just a bit of a curveball. It was uh, yeah. interesting. Have you got any final thoughts or anything that you'd like to share, Louise, before we bring this fabulous conversation to a close? Um, I think for me, I think all of this really roots back to kind of from a, a mindset side of things. I think if um, I think if leaders within a business are really making a difference and looking after their mindset and their, um, I've touched on emotional intelligence a couple of times, but if they've got the kind of the a good emotional intelligence, I think then then that starts to pick up on they understand their business more, you know, so the, the mindset and the emotional intelligence of the leaders, I think that can really kind of play out through a business because actually then I think kind of well-being element of it comes in because people open the free, their conversations, the empathy element of it all, it all fits together as well. So I think I think they're, they're a real, or the, those two areas for me are real positive that um that needs to be or they need to be positive within the mindset of take place with, from a leader's point of view. So I think it's, the better the leaders can be in a business in those type of areas, I think in essence it's better that the business starts to perform, you know, it's the employment engagement that comes with it, the retention that takes place, but also I think as as general business performance as well. I think they would I think people see do see an awful lot of difference when people are or the leaders are, are in the right place as well. Cause I think they can they can understand how the the, the systems manage properly. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. Well, if you want to stay on the line, Louise, and I just want to say thank you to anybody that has downloaded this. I will include a link to the free event that we're running this Friday. So if you are a business leader, an HR leader, a wellbeing manager that's looking for a more transformative approach to trauma, then please come and join us 11.30 a.m. UK time. And equally, if you are struggling with trauma, if you are dealing with something that just isn't shifting, then come and have that experience. There is no charge. There is no need to have your camera on or talk about it. So I will look forward to seeing you there. And any comments, please do drop them in the comments box. But otherwise, thank you. And I look forward to joining you again on another episode of the Mind Solution podcast. Bye-bye for now.